Okay, now we're going to get into some <laughs> nitty gritty questions. Um, I'm just going to go down the line with some very simple questions. And guys, as I've said, think about what you want to ask. We'll have about 10 minutes of um, questions from the audience. Um, so, first question is to Deborah. Yes, you're in the line of fire. So, with the ever increasing popularity of African culture, as we um, slightly mentioned already, in the Western world, i.e., Afrobeats and African fashion, do you suspect that we'll be seeing media houses such as Vogue? expanding their influence and presence in Africa over the coming years? Um, thank you for the question. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me, Norman and um, Sarah House. Um, yes, I do believe um, you know, media entities such as Vogue First and others will be looking to Africa, but as always, it's um, that entry point of how it's done, because it's not just about jumping on the bandwagon, it's all about the longevity of it of how we do it right. Anything, um, especially with Edward at the helm of British Vogue and what he's done, a lot of people thought he was going to come in and just put early black people on the cover or early, you know, certain demographic on the cover. And it's not that we have to, his whole thing was keeping it at that luxury level, but through the eyes of how it represents all of us. And it, it truly is a thing of making it resonate you know, you don't want to just pick up the magazine just because it's Vogue and it's just, it's like, who's going to have that help? How, who are we going to really chaperone and, and usher into those pages? Because it's a powerful thing to have that entity, you know, so it has to be done right. So I definitely do believe Vogue are looking to, into that. I, I know for a fact they are. I can't say can't more say than much. that. <laughs> but um, please, you know, be reassured that that is definitely on, on the cards. Um, we're excited about that, and it's, it, it is important in show, showing another perspective oh, of the continent and removing some of those negative barriers and stereotypes connotations, yeah. and connotations. Yeah. Um, for those of us, those of you who've been home, those of us who've been home, we know what it's like, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's really hard to articulate yeah. the mood, the feeling, the powerfulness that we have when we're in our own spaces and what we do. Um, so that yeah, that's brilliant to hear. Gerald, sir. Hello. Hello. Uh, founder, co-founder of Sofresh Medium. Which one? Both. Yeah, both. Right. Co-founder and co-founder. Okay, you're everything, all in one. Um, you being Ghanaian, you are Ghanaian, and having been to Ghana on various occasions, what key changes have you seen take place in Ghana when you look at redevelopment and growth over the years? And in your opinion, what do you think Ghana looks like in 10 years? Ooh, tough question. Is it tough? Nah, it's all right, it's all right. Yeah. Um, so, I was born in Ghana, um, came to the UK when I was a small child, um, I've gone back and forth um, and had this kind of burning desire to like, again, like what Norman was mentioning before, like reconnect with my roots and I saw the opportunity and I'd started this um, brand with co-founder Cyril and our thing was, you know, let's push creativity forward, let's be innovators and we're doing something that no one else was doing um, and we kind of hit a ceiling. But we thought that Ghana kind of opened up a new opportunity. So there's this video of us that exists where we're sitting down talking about, oh, we just arrived in London, sorry, we arrived in Ghana, this is our vision, blah, blah, blah. And in the background, if you look at the video now, the amount of development that's happened in the background with like the Bellagio that's opened up and all these other infrastructures. So you can see in a short space of time, so much has been built, so much infrastructure, um, which is positive. And the big thing really is the brand of Ghana. Like, you go around the world now, everyone knows Ghana, whether it's because of the World Cup in 2008, or whether it's because of, you know, the year of return more recently, um, African Americans trying to find their roots. Um, like, the brand Ghana right now is hot. Um, and, you know, that's testaments to us being proud of where we're from and really representing it. Um, again, going back to what Norman says, it wasn't cool being African, and now it is. You know, people are speaking Yoruba and tree in <laughs> <they're> like, what? <laughs> what? Um, but yeah, going forward, I think um, we need to um, really support the innovators in different sectors. So again, going back to us kind of supporting, you know, so fresh supporting Norman with this project and believing in him and elevating what he's done. What about people who can innovate in different sectors in healthcare? in um, agriculture, mm -hmm. in tech, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and, and the thing about Africans as well, that we have this attitude of, you know, we kind of shun young people and not, don't give them a voice. But meanwhile, you've got Zuckerberg from Facebook 
creating the future in America. <laughs> so we have so many innovators and they need the support to innovate in all these sectors because there's so much. Um, and the thing with Ghana as well, it's like it's, right now it's Accra, but there's so many places. Mm -hmm. Why can't Kumasi be the future for tech? Why can't Accra be the future for, you know, we can build a film studio there. Why can't Cape Coast be known for something else? So there's so much scope around Ghana in general. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I feel. That's no, my answer. It's, 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 it's a good answer. Um, Aji? I realise I didn't ask you guys to introduce yourselves, so my bad. Um, so please introduce yourself, what, who you are, what you do, then I'll ask you my, ask you your question. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ajay Yorande. I'm a commercial music and IP lawyer, and I'm also the co-founder of an app called Aburu. Um, it's an app that allows organisers of projects um, and festivals to book local creatives in Africa. Thank you very much. And so you've travelled and done business in South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Malawi, and you've had clients such as Afro Nation under, on your CV of um, collaborators. So it seems you obviously have a great experience of the social infrastructures in various parts of Africa. Um, what big challenges have you faced while working in African environments and what things do you think need to happen to combat this? Because I think there's a, definitely when you're in the West, an assumption that we're going to bring our Western ideals, we know these things, we know how to do things better without taking into account the culture, the pace, and even respecting how our cousins across the back at home do mm -hmm. things. And we can be a bit arrogant and ignorant to what, how it's supposed to work. However, there are some ways that we can bring some of our experiences from the West to kind of, okay, let's tighten up this kind of mm -hmm. behavior here and there. So what's your experiences and how do we combat some of those differences? Yeah, no, good question. I think for me, the biggest thing that I've had to learn over the years is to really internalize the fact that every country and every locality is different. Um, I think I've kind of adopted an approach of um, really focusing on adapting to the local way of doing things wherever I am. So that might be, for example, if you're doing projects, make sure that everybody is uh, paid before you leave the country. Um, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, it's also um, taking into account the different timelines um, across different countries in Africa. And um, for me, a recent thing that has really helped is always um, ensuring that I engage a local host um, wherever I go, um, both from a personal and a business perspective, to ensure that I'm kind of integrated in the right, integrated and introduced in the right kind of way, and to make sure that the experience is as authentic as possible for everybody involved. Um, so Malawi, for example, um, we were there recently to uh, do this kind of creative mixer event to onboard a bunch of creatives um, onto the app. So I uh, reached out to an ex-colleague of mine. Um, he helped to, uh, you know, just ensure that things were running properly on the ground before I arrived. So it just really made things a lot smoother and it meant that I was able to meet like 100 people in the space of like two, three days and to do so in the right uh, kind of way. So, um, yeah, I'd say the biggest thing is just making sure that you um, just bear in mind and remember the fact that every country is different. Um, there's a different local way of doing things. You have to humble yourself and remember that you're a guest in those places, even if you, you know, have that link. Like me, I'm, I'm Nigerian. I've lived in South Africa for um, seven, eight months at one time, but I'm still a guest. I still spend most of my time in the West. So, for the most part, I have to adapt whenever I go, um, whenever I go to the continent. Um, so, yeah, it's just about really bearing that in mind and ensuring that you, you, you know uh, kind of where you're coming from and where you're going to. That's brilliant. Um, no, so why did you choose Ghana first? And what inspired and compelled you to make this documentary about a country that you're not from? All right, thank you for that question. And thank you everyone just for <coughs> your amazing answers to the questions thus far and your contributions. Um, so why did I make the documentary? Well, this documentary really and truly is about six years in the making because I first went to Ghana in 2016. So I was at law school at the time at Queen Mary. And aside from doing placements like at Chambers and Firms here, um, I did a placement out there in Ghana. So an international legal internship with the legal aid scheme in Accra. So I was working with governmental lawyers to help provide legal advice and representation to Ghanaian citizens who otherwise couldn't afford it. So helping to lead mediation sessions, um, drafting witness statements, doing court, um, going to court sessions. That's stuff that average second year students shouldn't be doing, but you know, there's a way things work when you go back. So when you come back here, it looks great on your CV. So that was fantastic. <laughs> but aside from the work side of things, um, 
I fell in love with Ghana then um, because I'd been to Uganda two times prior, again where I'm from, in 2007 and 2011. So, um, and 2015, sorry, so three times prior. And it felt like home. There's something, there's like a, a synergy that I found between Ghanaian and Ugandan culture. It felt like a home away from home in terms of like the pace of which we move and the way in which we operate and how hospitable we are, just how welcoming Ghana was. And that's how much I found Uganda to be. So from when I arrived, when I was just living my day-to-day -day life and doing things and being part of that placement, I felt like I'd already been here. And that was a big thing, I think, especially, you know, with this whole thing of what is Africa, people want to understand, but I felt like I'd already been there, right? So with Ghana, aside from the work, every weekend I was basically in a different city, a different party. So I was, uh, the first weekend, I'll never forget this, my, my colleagues at work um, who were doing a national service, the one year work after university, they were like, Norman, there's a beach party in Kokobrito, do you want to come? And I was like, why not? So yeah, we took, literally took a, bar, a party bus from Central Accra out to Kokobrite. So Kokobrite, um, Tidal Rave was the name of the festival and it was literally a beach party. So like Sakode was there and a bunch of big stars. And this was in 2016, before, you know, like Ghana was Ghana now. Right, so Coco Brite, I went to Ho the following week. Um, I went to Cape Coast the following week after that, and then the last weekend I was um, at Charlie Wate, the street festival. So I got to have a rounded experience of time outside of Accra, and that's what I loved about Ghana. So, fast forward, um, I always felt that one, I'm going to return to Ghana at some point in my life, and two, uh, at that time I was starting to really come into my own as a creative aside from my career in law. So, I knew that I would want to try and again, going back to what I said in my initial speech about illuminating truths and beauties and stories about Africa. I knew that I would try to go back to Ghana because of what I'd experienced. And I felt that Ghana was an easier place to do so than Uganda where I'm from, because though I have uh, a social and cultural capital because of family and, and existing relationships, Ghana is, a, in my opinion, a much easier landscape to navigate through. So I felt that, okay, if I'm gonna make content and make it on a, a serious production where it can get played in a solo house, I think Ghana is the right place. And that's what we've been able to achieve. Um, so that was one part. There was a second part to the question I didn't catch. Um, it was just literally how did the documentary come together? Okay, so that's a, a separate question in itself. Um, so yeah, um, it began um, with, again, that inception of I'm going to come back at some point in my life. And it was because in 2016 when I was there, following that, there was the exponential rise in interest in tourism in Ghana. So when I was there in 2016, it was this thing of, Ghana's great, but it was a thing of if you know, you know, or you only go because you're from there. And I think that's where a lot of African countries still are. You only go there if you're from there. You don't really mm -hmm. catch a lot of cross-country travel. We haven't got there yet as a continent, but it is starting to change. So we hit 2019 and you had the year of a turn, right? And that was the big moment where, you know, the billions are coming in and the world is there. You have a Cardi B there, you have a Ludacris there, you know, the Obamas have been there prior to. So in 2019, it was almost like this explosion, supernova moment where the world is there. COVID hit in 2020, of course. 2021, I felt that, okay, if I'm gonna go, I feel like this is my window of time to do it because um, in terms of the world refining itself and resettling itself, this is a great time to sort of get back on the ground and, and pick up what's going on, but also do it through the lens of this phenomenon of COVID because COVID is a new thing. So I thought that could be an exciting edge to explore Ghana from as well. So um, I'd actually had a conversation with Aji because he'd done work in Ghana in 2019. He connected me to Cyril, who is the managing director of So Fresh, who's here today. And then from there, I had a call with Cyril and Gerald, and that was around October time of last year. And then from that, we just started brainstorming, what am I going to do, what are we going to do, and how is this going to work? And lo and behold, everything that I wrote down actually happened as far as press work at Afrochella, you know, talking about social economics with head of innovation at a Global Bank and all of these things. And then, so that was the Ghana side of things, come back to the UK, and that's where Lamar comes in, because, um, I didn't realise how difficult it would be, make, to be to make a documentary. I didn't really know what that actually meant. Mm. So we basically, it was a thing of, I came back from Ghana, um, I think around the 24th of January last year. Oh, about a month. So I got to experience Detty December in this, and all of this amazingness, right? And I can tell you now, get your tickets, go. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Um, but I came back with this hard drive, two terabyte hard drive of incredible footage, 4K footage, 5K even. But I didn't know what to, I didn't, I didn't know what it meant. I was like, I felt defeated because I was like, how am I going to get this thing made? So then I had, a, I had a meeting with Gerald, I think a week after I came back in Stratford in, West, in East London. And he gave me some ideas. And as you're saying things, I was like, wait, man, I could, Mark can do that. Mark can do that. Lamar, so I literally told him, I'm going to call you in 10 minutes. He picked up, I met him the following week and the rest is history. So everything he said is where the story kicks off. So that's how it came together. It was very organic. And even in terms of the soundtrack, 
Um, that was through Lamar's um, friend who's a British Ghanaian artist, um, Dr. Ish. He supplied us with six original tracks that are yet to be released, um, post-production photography, and then of course my multimedia team that made all of the logo, fonts, and so on and so forth, and of course the incredible media team here today. So in some, it's been a very organic process. It has even this idea of it getting in a Soho house, that wasn't actually the plan. It was just go Africa and get something made and let it be a time capsule for people like my beautiful niece, Elsie, who's here today. Mm. But for them, for them to see that, okay, like, this is what I was doing when I was this age and this is what Africa is. It's not this scary place, it's beautiful, mm. right? So um, that's really and truly how it, it all came together. So that's a long answer, but... Um, no, it's good, it's good to know, because it, it, it is, how do, you, how do you tell an important story about something that's so dear to your heart in a way that everyone's going to enjoy and understand? It's very difficult and the journey is real. Um, so thank you first of all, and also thank I have to thank you on behalf of your mum. You did lawyer and creative, so you didn't break her heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she never says it, but thank you. Thank you. I'm please. glad my mum is here because she'll be like, see, see, <laughs> see, <laughs> see. <laughs> can do both. Um, I wanted, before we move to the audience questions, I wanted just to say down the line, yeah. something about your home, whether Africa at large or your home country in Af on the continent, mm. that you you want to be shouted from the rooftops that maybe there's a misconception that people don't understand that's annoyed you, but something that you just think that your your country brings value to the world. It's uh, just a bit of a romantic question. Um, for me, I'm really passionate about young creatives and there is so much talent. I'm, I'm from Ghana. There's so much talent in Ghana and in Africa as a whole. And I, I personally, I'm on a mission to try and really amplify that so um that's one thing i would definitely want a lot more to be shouted about and also to educate our um brothers and sisters back home to kind of open their eyes to the possibilities of it's not just ghana it's just a whole world world out there and the talent that you have you could really excel and propel and i definitely for what i've seen in the western world i'm definitely going back and taking that knowledge back to amplify it across the globe mm. So I'm a filmmaker um, and I'm passionate about telling stories. Um, I know uh, the Hush Papi uh, film has been picked up. <laughs> That's another story, but I, I feel like there is so many kind of diverse stories that, that can be told to the world. And I have a great idea right now that I'm, I'm looking to get, to, to get made. And I feel like I want to empower um, young uh, emerging filmmakers as well. Um, I remember going to Ghana one time and there was like, uh, students basically writing uh, and, and kind of complaining about all these telenovelas coming from you know all these other countries mm -hmm. and so on so that, that, that's where I feel we can really empower um, the next generation so I'm from Nigeria um, and I think just want to really echo the point you just made um, about Norman and the way he's kind of doing both um, I like to think that I do the same and I'd like for Nigerians, which is where I'm from, to also understand that there are a lot of us that are doing the same and are doing it well. Um, I don't really want that to be seen as a as a sort of viable career path, as a viable way of like building yourself and growing as an adult and growing as a as a person. Um, it's not professional or creative. You can do both, and you can do both really well. That's a good one. Please, can you call my mum? <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, can you just clarify the question just so I'm just just a, like a, yeah. something you want Ghana or Uganda to be known for to shout about and to like maybe repurpose the misconception of Africa and African countries okay no, this is an easy one for me so with Uganda um, okay where East Africa again Africa by and large is you know third world the developing world but you know we're East Africa so we're seeing less than almost in, in the hierarchy of things you know Ghana and Nigeria are elite elite, right? Everyone goes there, you know, you've got doing your shaku and your sake and this, you got jello, you got everything, right? But with you know, Uganda it's like the community is not as big of course as Nigeria's community, especially in black black British London. And I feel that um, it's just about, you know, what I will say is this, right? And this isn't a knock at the BBC or anything, but like this thing of when I was young, comic relief would come on once a year, right? And every year they'd go to Uganda or Kenya and they would, I'm not saying these things weren't true, but all you would see at that time was just, again, the one hospital, just, they just go to the absolute slums. And I don't get me wrong, that's there and it happened. But when at that time, all you saw of the world was through TV and newspapers, now you can go on your phone and see what someone's doing in Australia. We couldn't do that 10, 15 years ago. Do you see what I mean? 
So I think my whole thing is just making sure that we're not just seen as almost the bottom of the barrel because we're East Africa or maybe the political situation is, is a bit, is, is a very shaky sort of thing. That there are beautiful stories happening there. There are, yeah. and it's not all doom and gloom basically, especially being on the East side where, you know, we haven't got the shining lights or the big Afrobeat stars that are literally global and, you know, mm. people want to be them basically. So that's one of my pushing games. And, and just on that note, you know, my family, my family are very proud Ugandans, like, and it's something that's been pushed into all of us. You know, I've got my cousins here. Guys, am I right in saying that? Yeah. 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 So, like, well, that's, uh, that's how we were raised. Like, you're Ugandan. You're almost like brainwashing. You're Ugandan. You're part of Ugandan. And it's like, it's something that's just carried through with us. And that's why I talk this way. It's something that I was raised with. And, you know, we had a, a community that would always meet up every Friday and that sense of community and belonging. And that's why I talk this way. And that's why I don't really see things in terms of, I'm Ugandan, you're our name. We're African. Yeah. Mm. We're a people. And yeah. we need each other to the same way we're all sat here right now. We're moving as a unit. We're not moving as individuals. I'm the Uganda representative, you're the Nige. We're Africans who are skilled at what we do, projecting a message, trying to make change. So that's how I feel. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So guys, we've got eight minutes for questions. Has anyone got a question? And don't be shy. Because I'll call on you. Okay, cool. I don't I mean, can you project or do you want the mic? Because you're further away. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, um, I think Ajay, Ajay, yeah, sorry. Um, I feel like we see a lot of artists um, who are using, not using, but adopting African culture in their music, but and a lot of international artists. I mean, but when it comes for them to go on tour, a lot of the time they say they're on a world tour, but Africa is not on that map. So, what do you think we are doing as Africans or in Africa that is stopping us from being part of those? World tours. Yeah, good question. Um, I think, to be honest, I, I do think things are changing. Um, I think the way that Africa is perceived, even by Africans, both in the what I call the immediate diaspora and the wider diaspora, um, is uh, is changing as well. Um, I do think there are front runners in the sense that. There are certain countries like South Africa, for example, with the Amapiana movement um, that are getting a bit more love and stuff than, than other countries. But um, one thing that I'm really trying to do with the like music law side of things and everything else I'm doing in music um, alongside the, uh, the creative stuff on the app is to try and project stories and um, spotlight artists and spotlight creatives across the entire continent. So when I was in Malawi, I made sure to not only connect with um, you know, creatives, like filmmakers and stuff, but also to find out who the next up and coming independent artists are, for example. So if you want a list, I can send it to you. I'm gonna be doing that around the entire continent. So that's my way of kind of knowing kind of who's on the ground and, and so on and so forth. And then hopefully that will make those people more, more proud um, to be from those places. And also maybe those in the diaspora that might not necessarily claim being from those places, they might now consider going back to those places. They might consider including those places as part of their, their, their world tours or whatever. Um, and I think another thing as well is just trying to remove this, the whole siloed nature of, of um, almost being African. So you have someone like Diamond Platinum, who maybe he'll do, up until recently, he might do a tour just in East Africa and maybe he'll go to Southern Africa a bit, but he won't go to West Africa. Or you might have Wizkid, who's just in West Africa, might go to South Africa. <coughs> you see what I mean? Now things are changing a little bit. You've got people like, uh, Blackie, if you've heard of Blackie, he's just finished like a Southern Africa tour, but he's planning to go to Nigeria, he's planning to go to East Africa and stuff like that. So I do think things are changing and I just think we have to be patient. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, uh, my question's for Deborah. Hi. So it's actually a, a two part question. Um, so given your experiences within the creative industry, um, what would you say are the defining qualities of successful creatives? And then what advice would you give to those who want to succeed within the industry? Um, the first question is success looks very different to everyone. Mm. So it, it really it really depends. I can only speak for myself. Mm. I still think I'm on the journey to success, even though mm. my God, you work at Vogue, it's like it's, to me it's like that's 
it, it was never the dream. I understand how big it is, but to me, I've got so much more I could give to the world and give as myself personally. Mm -hmm. So I would say success. I couldn't really answer that because that, that looks very different to every creative and every, every individual. And in terms of advice of how to um, step step into the industry or, or how to navigate the industry, yeah, both. Step, yeah. step, well, um, it's 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 the cliche thing of you know it's all about who you know, but it's also about your your network. You just ne in this room, like don't walk out without speaking to someone because mm -hmm. you just never know who's in here who can help you. And always be nice. To, don't always go for the I need something. Just speak to them. Oh, you know, how are you do doing today? Or what has your week been like? Have Build conversations and build relationships. It's not all about, you know, what can I get, what can I get? Because you just never know in 10 years' time that intern who was working at, uh, what you call it, a magazine that you have no recollection of could be the CEO of the company that you really want to work with. So it's all about building relationships. And that's where it starts. We've got, thank you. We've got time for maybe one question with a quick answer. One question for Norman. Um, regarding the documentary, being Ugandan, as you, you mentioned, and proud, uh, what was the main challenges for you uh, doing it in Ghana, and how did you overcome the challenges to, to flow there, and like, the contact, and to put everything together, basically? Even if Ghanaian are great people and very welcoming, as, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a really good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Thank you very much. Um, I think a lot of it was trust and faith, because again, um, this time I was going back to Ghana with a mission to try and film stuff, but it wasn't like, okay, I've got cousins here in X, Y, and Z location. Maybe they can get me to their friends or this or that. I'm really relying on, you know, Gerald and Cyril and who they said they can get me in touch with and what they could do. So it really was a leap of faith in many ways. Like, you know, I'm going to Ghana and, you know, it, it was party season. So regardless, I was going to have a good time. But, <laughs> but, but the way my mind works is that when I have a mission, like I would have left angry if I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve, especially traveling at that time, you know, COVID-19, getting in the country, all the fit to fly certificates, like it was hard. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was a move, it was a mission to even get in. So um, I had to really, to answer your question, I had to really trust in the people that I was with. And I think that's made me a lot more open as a person. I like to think I'm quite open and approachable and I'm a, I understand the nuances of communication, but in those circumstances, especially being, you know, in, in, I'm, I'm back in Africa and it's party season and a lot is moving very quickly you have to just trust people. So a lot of times, I'll give you an example. Um, I would be, um, okay, one, the last filming day, and you'll see this in the documentary, I had two interviews. One was with George Ajib Bang. He is the head of innovation at the Investment Bank Society General. We're talking all things socio, socioeconomics and politics and that sort of stuff. Then we go to the other side of town to Africa Global Radio. But then we end up going to Airport City to the house of one person who's like very big in the property game. And then it was a thing of, okay, this person's here right now, um, and Cyril said to me, go talk to him, basically give him the elevator pitch, and if we can get time of him to interview him, it will work. So there were a lot of spontaneous moments where we just caught people at the right time, and it was like, I could get their ear. So even, for example, in some markets, I was talking to people about the impact of COVID on their local business and how that's affecting you know, th their livelihood and things like that. So to answer your question, a lot of it was just faith and trust. The lucky thing for me, or lucky, the good thing for me, I would say, was because I'd been before in 2016, I had that confidence that I'm going somewhere that is friendly and hospitable, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, okay, this is my first time in this land and I'm trying to find my bearings. I already knew Labadi, Cantonments, you know, um, Osu, I already knew, I had already had bearings in my head. It's just I went back now and things were more developed, which made things even easier. Do you see what I mean? Because the airport had improved from when I went in 2016 and, you know, at Kotoka. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but the crux of it really is just faith and trust in the people and it's just all it was all a giant reminder that there are good people on this planet and if you trust people and you just put out a good energy it does come back to you tenfold sometimes mm -hmm. and that was literally my experience in ghana it was just such a beautiful time so um that's a brilliant way to end <laughs> thank you very much uh, thank you for the panel you have 10 minutes to freshen yourselves get snacks